think we were uh, pretty much through the text of the fourth clause. Have I? Oh, yep, thanks. Any more of these? Which lines? Um, have I raised any more? You didn't get one of these, did you? Which five? Uh, it's on canvas. Yeah, I haven't done yet. I think it's Thank you. All my homework for the week for my other classes is being Sunday night and then Tuesday. Really? So. Okay. Well, if you miss the lecture, Friday's lecture, then that quiz. Yeah. It's it's I, all on. It's all online. I have the homework at Wednesday or Friday. But okay. I think we were we were a little bit further than this actually, but um, <laughs> yeah, because I covered that right there. You mentioned this right here: substitution for RT for guided bend tests. Uh, in lieu of mechanical testing or RT of the qualification test system, there's a welding operator may be qualified by RT. We talked about substituting uh, UT, which is a, a common thing that gets done, but it's not really, it's not code. You cannot substitute ultrasound for destructive testing. You can substitute X-ray for uh, destructive testing, but you cannot substitute UT, but it's a common thing that's done all the time. And UT is usually more stringent. Most welders don't like, um, they don't like to be UT because you can pick uh, so much stuff out more than you can with RT. Um, and, it's, and it's usually, it's usually harder to argue with the technician. Because when you're looking at UT results, if you're not a UT technician, you really don't know what you're looking at. Right. You're looking at like little spikes and little different colors and things like that. And they can say, oh, look right there. See, that's a that's a elongated slag inclusion right there. That's that's too long. And you're looking at it going, and it looks like it looks like some peaks and some valleys and some colors. And you have no idea. But with an RT radiographic, you're actually looking at, you know. Uh, a look right through the weld and so you can see exactly what they're talking about so most people don't like UT to be done anyway most welders don't like UT to be done anyway because it's hard to argue with the technician and uh, it, it picks out more things so but you cannot substitute UT for destructive testing uh, for welder performance qualification or even for uh, production welding um, we're going to go just a little bit further here and then take a look at the charts. We, we actually got a little further. Uh, what, what we're going to be doing for the lab for this will be CVN testing because most, most of you guys have not done a CVN test. Um, you'll be doing a simple plate test where you have to extract from that plate uh, three uh, 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter by uh, two and seven eighths inch long CV and I'll, I'll have a drawing for you so you have to memorize that but uh, there are there are stipulations and differences with those uh, test plugs that you pull out of there but uh, just to show you uh, what that's all about we'll be doing CV and testing on the uh, Sharpie V notch machine that we've got in the, in the lab in there. so uh, a couple of options for the number of CBN specimens to be taken from a single test location, option A is three specimens, and that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, the requirements for doing this is always stipulated in the contract documents. Um, yeah, only when specified in the contract documents. Okay, so. What, when, would you, when would you want to see, when would you expect to see uh, some kind of uh, contract or some kind of job where they re they're going to require CVM testing? So it's going to be inserted in cold temperatures? 
cold temperatures, yeah. Or when the engineer wants the, the material, and I, it's generally steel, but when the engineer wants the, the material, the steel, to be able to withstand a certain uh, impact strength. There's different applications for that um, out in the real world. But it'll have to be specified in the contract documents. And uh, you usually know about that well beforehand, but the testing is gonna have to require CBN testing. Um, for retesting, this is for, this is uh, for, uh, once again, this is for uh, performance qualification. For retests, it says each individual, uh, the value of, when the requirements of these are not met, that is for CBN, one retest may be performed. Each individual value of the remaining three specimens shall equal or exceed the minimum specified average value. So if you don't, go, if you don't get a good test from the first set of coupons that you get, you can retest. Uh, with another set from the same same sample, and uh, reporting is on a different document. Okay, so we we actually looked at this, and I'm going to go over just one more time. Once again, this is for welding procedure qualification. So if you're if you're qualifying a procedure, uh, this is the table that you would use. If it's uh, a plate test, you're doing a qualification test on plate. And you have a complete joint penetration group. What is a complete joint penetration for D11? What's it got to have? A backing bar. Or it can have a non-consumable backing bar. But it still has to be removed and the backside of the well has to be reworked. Okay. But notice, uh, I, and I'm doing this for benefit of well, some people were here last week, plus it's Monday morning, so you're probably still half asleep. But if we do a complete joint penetration groove test, notice that the test positions, and you should know these, 1G is flat, 2G is horizontal, 3G is vertical, 4G is overhead. Notice that each one of these tests, if you do a 3G test, you're qualified for vertical. I mean, that, that procedure is qualified for vertical. Is it qualified for flat? No. It's craziness, isn't it? That's stupid. It's craziness. Okay, but you're testing the procedure. That's why, uh, okay. that's why uh, you have this discrepancy here. So be, be sure to notice that because a lot of people get caught on this. They'll come right to this chart when they're testing a welder, and this is not for testing a welder, this is testing a welding procedure specification. And then you also have uh, for plate fillets, the same values here, the same testing positions, and then this is what they're qualified for. Notice that they are the same as the CJP groove well. And then also, if you take this kind of a test to qualify a procedure for a TK and Y joint, notice that it does not apply. Same thing, notice that it does not apply. Why does it not apply? I've mentioned this a few times now. Because they've moved those requirements to a new clause, it's clause nine. So this, this, this clause, clause four, does not apply to tubular shapes, whether it's square, round, rectangular, or whatever it might be. Okay. You have to go to another clause. And it says right here, fillet wells in production T, Y, or K connection shall conform to figure 912. So you're in nine, you're in uh, clause nine. Uh, one last thing, uh, this um, right here. So if you do uh, CJP grooves and you're testing the procedure, you do a, uh, for production pipe welding. Notice that if you do these tests, notice that there are some, some uh, limitations as far as what that procedure can be used for. But notice in a butt joint for pipe, you have to come down here to B, it says it qualifies for circumferential wells in pipe equal to or greater than 24 inches. So if it's 24 inches or greater, you're qualified for that butt weld pipe joint. That procedure is. 
make sure you realize that's a procedure chart. This is also uh, uh, a weld procedure specification qualification. This is for complete joint penetration groove wells, the number and type of test specimens. So when you're doing the testing for the procedure, this is the chart you're gonna to come to to determine the number of specimens you need to take and what you're qualified for, uh, what that procedure will be qualified for in uh, thickness. Let's take a look at it really quick. These are sometimes a little misleading to your eyes at first, but this T is simply talking about the thickness of your testing. So if you look at that little formula, it says one eighth less than or equal to the T. And then it says less than or equal to three eighths, I think. Yeah. So this T is the, is the thickness you're talking about in your test. If it's between eighth inch and three eighths, this is the bracket that you're gonna be looking for. So if it's quarter inch, you just substitute that in for the T. Quarter inch is less than or equal to the three eighths and a uh, quarter inch is, uh, is greater than the minimum. So you're right in the range right there. You're, the size of your, of your test is this T right here. If it's a thicker one, then it's gonna be, your T is gonna be between three eighths and one inch. So the way to read that is this is your minimum uh, for this range, this is the maximum for that range, and then this is the minimum for this range, and this is the maximum for that range. So if we're doing a half inch test, you're gonna pull two reduced section tensiles and four side bends. And if, that's, if that procedure test passes, all four side bends are good, and the reduced uh, section tensiles uh, will uh, be within uh, at least uh, the tensile strength of the material or greater. If those pass, then this is the range that you're qualified, that procedure will be qualified to do. Notice it's one eighth for a minimum and two T for the thickness. So you're good up to one inch if it was a half inch test. But in all cases for D11, one eighth is gonna be the minimum. If you're working on something less than one eighth, what have you gotta do? You've got to go to a different specification, which is 1.3. That is listed in clause one of this book. It tells you that. Right? Okay. Uh, same thing. This is in millimeters. Notice that this is the same thing, only it's in millimeters. Same chart, only the dimensions are in millimeters. Okay. Dimensions in inches, dimensions in millimeters. Right, this is the number and type of test specimens and plate range thickness qualified for partial joint penetration grooves. So it's the same thing. It just tells you what you get to pull out of a test in order to test that procedure and what the range is if that procedure qualifies. Okay, uh, and this is, uh, this is in inches. So this is in regular uh, standard measurement. Um, this is for fillet wells, so partial joint penetration and fillet wells. These are the essential variables. So when we look at uh, in the back in, in Annex M, uh, all of those specifications, all, all of those things that are listed on a welding procedure, all the essential variables, this is a chart that tells you what is going to be an essential variable uh, for, for stick, subarc, MIG, flux core, and TIG. Notice that, let's just take a look at SMAW. Where it's blocked out like this, that means it does not apply. So if you have an increase in filler metal classification strength, uh, that is going to be an essential variable in stick. So if you have a welding procedure that, is, uh, that shows a 70,000 pound tensile strength rod, and your contractor wants to use 60,000 pound tensile strength rod, is that gonna be allowable? Um, keep that in, keep, keep your answer in mind. And then, go away. Okay, I'll just go back to the first page. Um, so 
So we're looking right here, filler metal. Increase in filler metal classification strength. That is, a, that is a, an essential variable for requiring WPS requalification. So your contractor wants to go to 60,000. What does it say? Oh, darn it. What does it say right there under footnote A? It says the filler metal strength may be decreased without WPS requalification. So you can decrease the welding rod filler strength, but you cannot increase it. Okay, that's where that's where looking at these footnotes and reading these footnotes becomes uh, quite clear. There's a there's a bunch of them, but filler uh, uh, footnote A deals with filler metal strength may be decreased without a WPS requalification. So you want to make sure that you see that. These are all essential variables uh, which require a change in the WPS if you change them according to what is stated in these 37 different declensions here. There's three pages of them. Where it's shaded, that means that it does not apply. If you are, once again, back at stick, if you are changing uh, to an electrode or a flux color, uh, flux electrode classification not covered in 5.1 or 5.5. So if if there is an electrode that comes along, the contractor wants to use, uh, I don't know, Nautilus um, atom bomb electrode. And it's not listed in the 5.1 or the 5.5. Is that going to be kosher? No, it's not. Not for D11. He's going to have to do a requalification test with that rod. That happens. <laughs> happens all the time. Um, somebody gets sold a bunch of rods and they want to use it. Well, it doesn't fit within this, so it doesn't it doesn't work for this welding procedure. You're going to have to rewrite the WPS and have to retest it, which can be quite costly. So the essential variables for uh, doing a WPS. Um, supplementary. When you see the word supplementary, the PQR, supplementary essential variable changes for CVN. Supplementary, when you see that word, it always refers to CVN. Sharpie V notch. When you get into the ASME, <coughs> you will, it, it is a separate column in the essential variable listings that we'll look at when we get into ASME. Uh, it's a whole separate column. What they've done there is they've just said, well, we're just going to make a whole separate column for Charpy V-notch testing. And they've, they've listed in that column the essential and non-essential variables. And uh, every one of the processes in ASME has its own separate page. Instead of having all these three pages where everything's on it, and then switching to this uh, uh, supplementary chart, in ASME, they've just they've just included it very nicely in each one of the procedures, so it's it's a lot quicker in my in my opinion. But for if you're doing something where there's going to be a supplementary or a CVN testing, there's a whole new list of essential variables. So the first set of charts is for regular essential variables for all those processes, and the second set of charts is for supplementary essential variable that require a retesting. And there's quite a few, um, quite a few differences. Uh, okay, now this is just a chart for electro slag or electro, uh, uh, electric gas welding. Um, we used to do that in 3630, but I don't know that we have the equipment anymore to do it, but uh, what, when would you use this process? I don't Anybody ever do any electro slag or electro gas? When you're doing a piece of material that's 14 inches thick, can you imagine the welding that's going to be required to weld 14 inches thick a B group? Subarc. Hmm? Subarc. Well, yeah, or even or even using subarc, can you imagine? It's 
Yeah. Electro slag, electro gas is a process where you take two 14 inch pieces of steel and you, you put them, you butt them together. And you set this electro slag machine up and you turn it on and it just bores right down through 14 inches to the bottom. And it makes, it welds the two pieces together. <laughs> it's, it's quite a process, but a lot of it's done in ship and in armor plating or in really heavy weldments. Uh, you guys do a lot of nuclear stuff, I think, out there. Could be done there as well, but... Uh, we don't do it there. We've done 14 inch thick, but it's, I mean, that, that was a nightmare. Oh yeah. Three yeah. feet, 400. Yeah. Five degree bubble, and it was a thousand pounds of cool there. Yeah. It's 332 wire. These are essential variables. If you're ever qualifying a procedure for those processes, uh, they will have to take a look at a short video to show that. Um, same thing, this is the same thing. Okay, now, this chart here is applicable to uh, all of these, uh, that are all of the steels that are listed in this book. So this is a table for, uh, for table 3-1 and table 4-9 and unlisted steels qualified by PGR. So if you're, if you're writing a procedure or you're testing a procedure and you're looking at this procedure trying to make sure that it's correct. The, the base metal groupings, uh, when, when you weld one group to another group, there is a, a, it's stipulated as to which ones can be welded to each one. Any, any group one steel to any group one steel. And if you recall from back in clause three, those pages and pages of steels that we looked at. Clear on the left hand side, there's a Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three, Roman numeral four. And then there's even some in there that, that are listed as unlisted. And that's when you bring in a steel that's not listed there. Can you, can you write a welding procedure for that? Yes, you can, as long as you write a procedure and you prove it. But for, for, for welding one group to another group, this is the chart that gives you the recipe for doing that. Any group one to any group one, any group two to any group two, any group three to any group one, any group three to any group two, any group three to any group three, or four to four, or any table steel to any table steel. This gives you the, the qualifications, the combinations that are allowed. So if you do any group one to any group one, you're good or any group one to any group one. That sounds like really fast double talk, but it's not. You, you can't mix and match groups randomly. It's, it's specified. If, if you do a group two to a group three, that's fine as long as you test it. So it says any group one to one, two to two, two to two. So if you do a group two to a group two, notice that you're qualified immediately for group one to group one, and so forth. Uh, group three to group one, a specific group three or table four nine steel tested to any group one. So this is the chart that tells you what groups that you can combine and which ones that you can, right? Um, all right. Code approved base metals and filler metals requiring qualification per clause four. Uh, this is a comprehensive group of steels listed in these charts. And it starts off with this ASDM, ASDM 871, which is a 70,000 pound, well this grade is a 60,000 uh, pencil strength material either one of these. Notice you can use the, the stick process, but you have to use electrodes specified in A5.1, and here are your classifications that are usable for this steel. Notice there is no preheat requirement. Right? All of these, if you have uh, up to three quarters of an inch, you have to have a 50 degree Fahrenheit minimum preheat temperature. If you're out in Wyoming, you're working on an A72, and it's it's five degrees, you have to heat that up to at least 50. And 50 doesn't do much for a preheat. 
Uh, that's usually 150. We usually go to 150. But you have these preheat temperatures that are compliant for all of the materials in this in this uh, chart. Uh, A514 is a very common boilerplate steel. Uh, you can look these up back in clause three to tell you what the carbon content is of it. But this is a quick reference chart. It's a 90,000 pound tensile strength. You can weld it with, uh, with stick, with sub arc, with MIG, and with flux core, as long as you follow these specifications. And then they've listed the electrodes that are pre-qualified to be able to be used with any steel that is in the A514 group. And then the preheats are gonna be the same. And as you go through here, uh, there's gonna be different steels listed. 517 is fairly common. Uh, that's not a very common one. Not very common. Those are, these are, I think these are actually duplexes. Okay, so just realize that these are base metal and filler metal uh, combinations that require qualification for clause four. And this is the recipe or the formula for doing it. All right, now we come to this chart, which we looked at briefly on Friday. This is the welder qualification chart. Now notice, and this is where everybody gets those two confused. If you do a 3G and a 4G plate test, groove plate test, you're qualified for all of this welding, all the way across. See that? Production box two welding, production pipe welding. If you do a 3G and a 4G, you're qualified for all of them. And this is the case where last April when I started doing that uh, work for uh, doing those uh, pipes that they're supposed to be doing here in the next month uh, in Salt Lake City, I had the welding, the welding was tested in the 3G and the 4G. I did both the 3G and the 4G for 7010 root, 7018 fill, and then 7018 root and 7018 fill and cap. I did, I did two sets of procedures but I did them all on the 3G and the 4G. And the engineer from San Francisco said, uh, your procedures aren't qualified for all of the positions that you're gonna be in. Well, yeah, they are. I, I did 3G and 4G, uh, rather than do a 1G, 2G, 3G, and 4G. But he says, your procedures aren't qualified because they're not qualified in the flat. And I think I showed you with this on Friday how when you when you change the angle of this little device, it tells you the flat, vertical, horizontal positions as you go through that 90 degrees. Well, the only thing we're not qualified for is flat. And we went back and forth with emails quite a bit. You know, we, we, will, we will do another procedure if you want us to. It's just, it's just generally considered, if you, if you can do a 3G and a 4G, you're qualified for doing flat because it's the simplest way to do it. Yeah, but we don't know whether your procedure will work in the flat. That's one of the absurdities of this code. So in the end, they sort of gave in and said it was okay. We'll proceed with the procedures that you've got and the welder qualifications that you've got. And I still have to test welders for that job that's coming up next month. But this is, this is the chart for welder qualification. This is 410. Table 41 is the chart for uh, procedure qualification. Uh, now, for welder, uh, welder qualification, uh, for the number of specimens that you have to pull, and then the diameter that you're qualified for, thickness and diameter that you're qualified for, this one is the chart that's in inches. There's another one that's going to be in millimeters. Same chart. So if you like doing metric, you use this chart. If you like doing inches, you use this chart. Be able to, you should be able to uh, work within both of them. How many millimeters are there in an inch? 25.4. So you should realize that 10 is about half, and so on and so forth. You should, should have a little bit of a working knowledge about metric. But notice if, if we do a type of, if we do a, a groove weld and we're doing a half inch thick groove weld. So 
here's here's the uh, groove that we're the type of that as well as the groove, and um, we're doing a one half inch. Remember how to read these. The T is the size of your material. So if you plug in half inch, you are greater than three eighths and you are less than one inch. So the range of this test is three eighths to one. You have to do two side bends. And then if you qualify, if the welder qualifies and, and passes that test, he is qualified with these dimensions. He can do eighth inch minimum to two times the max. Right? Notice there's a little D right there. So you should always go down and see what the D says. It says also qualifies for welding any fillet or PJP weld size on any thickness of plate, pipe, or tubing. So if you do that half inch test, that groove test, and the two side bends pass, then this welder is qualified to do eighth inch to, to one inch thick, all fillets, and all grooves on partial joint penetrations. That's a pretty wide ranging qualification, isn't it? Okay, so a lot of, a lot of places will try to limit what a welder does but I like to look, I like to get them to test so that they get the widest range of what they can do. Do one test to get the widest range of what you can do. That's why I showed you this. Half inch test on plate groove uh, in the vertical, one in the vertical, one in the overhead, that's gonna be pretty much an unlimited welder until you get over one inch. All right, now if you do a one inch, if we go back and we do a one inch, come back up here, you do a one inch, that's one or over. Notice, you only do two side bends. And he's qualified from one eighth to unlimited. And then all fillets and all partial joint penetration groups. So I try to keep it within those two, those two tests. Okay. Um, there's a few essential variable changes that will change the uh, change that qualification. If you change one of these declensions here for welders, it's going to change his certificate. It will require requalification. So if he's qualified in one particular thing, and if you come over here and you want to change the process to a process not qualified. Short circuit is considered a separate process, so that is that is not uh, not included here. But for welders, to a, if he's not if he's taken a, a, a test and he's doing a process other than what he's qualified for, that's going to be a limiting factor. He can't just go from stick welding to TIG. Well, I'm qualified to do all grooves and all fillets. Yeah, but with stick. Okay. So any of these. If you change any one of these uh, down to, to declension six, if you change any one of those, he's not qualified. He has to be qualified. Okay, and then here is an electrode classification group. Uh, it's different than API and it's different than ASME. So you have to make sure that you, you realize if you're writing in the F number on your uh, procedures and on your welder qualifications, uh, that you get the right group uh, designation in here. F4s uh, are 7018s, uh, 7016s. I wanted to talk about this one just a little bit. Ever, anybody ever hear of this one? XX48? Okay, one means all positions, right? Two means flat or horizontal. Three means flat only flat only. Just in the last few years, they've, they've come up with a four. So you could buy a 7048. 7048 is the only acceptable low hydrogen that is, the four means vertical down. Because <laughs> so many people have a hard time welding vertical up with 7018. I don't know. You get used to it, you, you, it's like riding a bike. But they've come up with another low hydrogen that you can weld in the vertical down. So 7048 
or 8048 is a downhill rod. They use it on pipe a lot because pipe liners like going downhill. Sometimes they have to have that higher strength, but there's so many rods now that they can use in pipeline that are higher strength. But I wanted you to be aware of that. There's a trick question on the test concerning that. And everybody will put, that's an overhead rod. It's not talking about those positions necessarily, but that, that third letter in that electrode classification number talks about the position that it can be used in. But four doesn't mean overhead. In this case, four means vertical down, okay? So you have these different groups. Notice F3 is uh, most of your 6010s, 6011s, and then F1s, all of these are 20, 24, 27, 28, 20, and 27. Those are all jet rods. Those are all absolutely flat purpose rods. They call them jet because you can go so fast with them. High deposition, uh, high rutile coating on the uh, Electrocode. Typically now, in, in uh, AWS D1.1, if you've qualified in an F4 category electrode, you are considered qualified for all of the other ones. If you've qualified with an F2 rod, you're qualified for F2 and F1. If you've done an F3 electrode, you're qualified for F2, F, F3, F2, F1. And so consequently, if you do an F4, then you qualify for the rest of them. If it's on your, if it's on your welder qualification form. Um, okay, C, this is the CV and test requirement. We'll probably end up right here. So uh, for stick, uh, you're gonna take a, you're gonna take a coupon from the weld metal area, and you're gonna take three specimens. The size is always in millimeters. It's 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters. And the average, uh, minimum average absorbed. So you're gonna take those three and you're gonna take the total of the Charpies and you're gonna, you're gonna get a, uh, a minimum. You can't have anything lower than, well, we're gonna, we're gonna be using joules. So you can't have anything lower than 27 joules. And then uh, uh, when you average them together, it has to be above 27. And the minimum individual absorbed energy is 20. So this is kind of the row that we're gonna be doing. One of the problems is, is sometimes you get something that's less than a 10 by 10. So if you have a 10 by nine, 10 by eight, 10 by 7.5, notice they put everything, you have to have at least one side that's at least 10. What happens if you have two sides, neither of which are 10? In the scrap bin. You failed that one, but what's the requirement from the text that I showed you? You take three. If you have a failure, you can take three more. Yeah, three more. You take three more. So you can go back and cut another one, right? That's the way I see it. You can cut. You can cut a total of six if you want, and then get three of them out of there. How do you get it to exactly ten by ten? Mm -hmm. Usually you have to mill them, okay? So there'll be a little milling involved. But if you, if you get it smaller, notice, notice you can go all the way down to two and a half millimeters by 10. But notice what they do to the temperature requirement. The test temperature reduction below the specified test temperature. A lot of people go, oh, well, but even if I go down here to 10 by three, you know, I only have to meet 40 degrees. No, that's 40 below the minimum specified temperature. And usually these are at zero degrees Fahrenheit. How do we get them down to zero degrees Fahrenheit? We bathe them in liquid nitrogen. Then we pull them out of there and we stick them in the Charpy v notch and whack them. And then that will give us a joule reading on the little, the little readout, the digital readout. So your, your samples, if they're smaller, have to handle a higher which is really lower <laughs> temperature. They're gonna to have to withstand a higher impact at a lower temperature because there's less area. So you wanna get those 10 by 10. And how do we pull those out? I'm gonna fast forward to this. You 
you guys pretty well know all this stuff. This is the last thing I'm gonna let you go. Okay, so here's your single V groove butt joint. These are all different, different joint types, but we're gonna be right here in this one. If we do a half inch, thickness is less than or equal to a half inch. Uh, I've got a lot of half inch bar in there. We'll probably just use that. Uh, you can see this dashed line here. So you're looking at the plate laying down. So you're gonna weld these two things together like this. And you're gonna pull out of that three 10 by 10, okay? You can saw them down, you know, and I don't, I don't care. You can, you can grind them if you want to. You can use a saw back and grind them and just use a micrometer, get them down to 10 by 10. You know, if you love milling, then you can get in one of the machines in there and mill them down to what you want. Uh, but you're gonna pull three of them. But that's what, that's what this is showing right here. And this little goofy looking thing right here is the notch that you're going to broach in it. We have a broacher in this other lab in here. So you take that, you take that square looking piece like that, you got that square piece, and then you're going to put a V notch just like that, right in the middle of it. You got this cool little machine, you just put it in there and you just crank this thing down and it broaches a V-notch in it for you. So you put your V-notches in there and maybe for time's sake, we'll just do one. But if you're doing an actual test, you have to pull three for stick. And then you have to get uh, three of them that has an average of 27 joules or higher. You can have, you can only have one that has a value. Well, you can't have any that has a value less than 20, okay? So I think that's about the end of that. Yeah, that's the end of the chapter. So we have come to time. Any questions? Yes. So when you're qualifying the welder, do you have to do a CVN or is it just for qualifying the procedure? Um, if you're qualifying a procedure, I mean, if you're doing a job where there's going to be a CVN requirement on the job, you're qualifying the procedure not the welder. Okay. So, is that, was that your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, hoping you guys aren't labbed out yet. You labbed out yet. <laughs> uh, there's, there's plenty of three by half bar laying there. That's mine. So, um, you know, if you love to weld, do a seven inch or an eight inch. I don't care. But we're gonna do a we're gonna do a vertical up. I don't care if you do a MIG. You can do a TIG. You can use three hundred nine filler. I don't care what you use. Just have to specify it, okay? And did you say there has to be a backer on it? Yes. Why? Because it's D one one. I should have recorded some of that stuff, you know. I'm sure it's recorded. I'm sure it's recorded. It's crazy. I mean, some of these guys are Cubans, you know, and they do throw shoes when they disagree with you. I mean, I'm, I'm all about the, the structural background. Background your roof. Yeah. Fill it back up, but yeah. why the hell do you have to have a backer? It's... I don't know, whatever. My personal, I'll throw a little personal opinion in here, that welding on structural is so simple in the world of welding. And I think they have a little bit of an ego problem because the ASME guys, we're dealing with all different kinds of grades and pipe is more, is usually, uh, you know, a lot more stringent. There's a lot more pressure and things involved. 
Structural welding is just kind of like vanilla welding. It's like macaroni. It's like mm -hmm. once you've welded for three years in the structural world, you've done about everything there is in the structural world. But they have to have something that makes them set apart from the other codes. So they, they, they say, we, we will not yield on this backer bar thing. The only thing they've done, and you can do this, they now specify in the new code that if you don't use a steel backer, you can use a non-consumable backer. So if you can find a copper bar somewhere, and there are some on the shelf in the, in the welding where they keep all the helmets and stuff, there's copper bars in there. Or if you can find a ceramic bar, or anything that is non-consumable, you know, something that's not gonna impregnate your, your well, you can certainly use those. But you know as well as I do how freaking hard it is to get a backer bar off once you've welded it on and it's all right. fused together. Now over the years, I've gotten really good with a torch and I can start on the corner of a two by quarter and I, I can wash all the way across the bottom of that thing and knock that thing off with one cut after a while you can, but to answer your previous question is it's because they've got to have something where they can hold on to you everybody knows that a welder that's welded for three or four years can weld an open root easily yeah. they will not relent on it so use a backer bar or use a uh, you know or or test it yourself do an open root but they will not consider it a complete joint penetration. <laughs> Even if your background, okay, but don't you have to, well, so the backer bar per D1 line, it stays there? Or you have to knock it off and background and refill it up anyway? For testing and for the infield structural purposes, it has to be air, out, air arc gouged off. and ground and re-welded. Now, now think about this for a minute, Steve. These guys that do this, they're New Yorkers, they're Miamians, they're Las Vegas people, they're, Cal they're LA County people. What's what for? Because well, I know you're from down there, aren't you? Yeah. So you, you, this might, you, might re you might understand this. Those towns that I just mentioned are heavy union towns and you're taking work away from the welder. Think of how much longer it takes to weld one of these things up with a back of our, then, okay, day two, now we've got to carbon arc this thing back off, and then, you know, the second half of that day, we've got to have a helper get in there and grind all that out. When he gets it ready, then the welder, he can go over there and he can spend another day welding that bottom. That, that's, my, that's my observation. Yeah. Everywhere else you go, you know, if you go to Dodge City, Kansas, they're like, what, freak? No, we're not doing that. Just weld it up, you know, and, and they're done with it. Yeah. But there's a lot of union towns that say, you know, Las Vegas, even now, still has cement trucks that are rear discharge cement trucks. And I never understood that. All that work that I did down in Vegas for Kern River, every time we'd have to order a truck with, for uh, a flowable fill, like to fill in a pipe that's underground or something like that, They'd bring a truck out there, and it's one of these old rear fill, rear discharge cement trucks. Whip it. And there's another guy right in the cab. He's got to get out of there, and he's got to put all the things down there. And the other guy sits in the truck, and he runs the controls. And he's signaling to the other guy. Sometimes they have three guys. You know, it's a union town, and they will not allow those front discharge unloading cement trucks because you're taking one guy away from the union. That's my explanation for that because everybody else knows it just drives you freaking crazy, some of the things. I told you, I got, call, I got pulled out of one of those meetings into the hallway and I was told by one of the officers of the AWS, stop arguing with that guy. I thought we were about trying to arrive at a truth to this. Yes, yeah, but you need to stop arguing with him. You have no idea who that, I know who he is. I know he's been with the Welding Society a couple of years longer than I have, but I mean, we're talking reason and logic here. Yeah, just stop arguing with him. I'm telling you, 
I don't want to see you arguing with this guy anymore. He might, he might get mad and leave the AWS. That's literally what you're dealing with. So don't try to confuse me with the facts. My mind is made up. Yeah. Sort of a thing. <laughs> it's crazy. You know? and, and, I've, and I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen, you know, when you're trying to make a statement, they're <laughs> pounding their shoe on the table. Jeez. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sorry. we will uh, we'll uh, try to put that together as a lab. Everybody cool with that? <laughs>